And we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers, and in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. This is your brother Imran Hussein, uh, welcoming you again after a break of about two months uh, from this, the studios of the Islamic Broadcasting Network here in my native Caribbean island of Trinidad. Uh, you with a greeting of assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be with you. Uh, this lecture can be viewed on uh, ibntt.com, the website ibntt.com, and also on YouTube Live at IBN Master. Uh, we will speak for about 40 minutes and then at 8.40, if there are any telephone calls, you can call in with your questions. At, uh, the number is um, at 868-645-4426 and 868-663-8373. You can call in with your questions at uh, 840. I have to report to you, alhamdulillah, I returned to Trinidad two days ago, early in the morning. After spending two months abroad traveling in uh, Britain for the first time in many, many years, and in France and in Switzerland. And I'm happy to report that I had no problems, alhamdulillah, in my travels. I was treated with respect by British immigration, by French immigration, and I had no problems as well in Switzerland. We had a seminar on the 29th of July in Geneva uh, on uh, electronic money, digital money. And uh, the subject is still on the front burner. It is the most important subject uh, which we should be directing attention to at this time, the subject of money. That seminar was successfully conducted. And uh, I visited Britain. I was able to meet with my grandson. I have only one grandchild, a grandson in London, and he's three years of age, three years of age, and I never met him. So I was able to meet with Ayman for the first time uh, and uh, have some, spent some time with my grandson. I spent some time with my students in London. I went up to Manchester. I went to Birmingham and so on. And uh, uh, I spent one month in France writing my book on uh, Dajjal, and I'm happy to report to you it is now perhaps 99% completed. Uh, the topic is Dajjal, the Quran, and the Awwalu Zaman, or the beginning of history. Dajjal, the Quran, and the beginning of history, Awwalu Zaman. And perhaps in another one week, I can complete that book, inshallah. And uh, there will be four more books on Dajjal, a total of five books, at least, I hope, not more than five. Uh, the second book after this will be uh, From Jesus, the True Messiah, to Dajjal, the False Messiah, a journey in Islamic eschatology. Uh, that book is already about half finished. It may take me a few months to complete that book. Uh, Insha'Allah. And then the third book will be entitled Dajjal and Money, which is a tough book to write, uh, to simplify the subject so that the scholars of Islam, most of all, uh, would be able to understand the subject because they don't know the subject because it's not taught to them. So I have to write a book on the Dajjal and money that the scholars of Islam will be able to study it so they could understand the subject. Inshallah, it is so important for them to understand it. The fourth book will be on Dajjal and the feminist revolution and Islamic response to the modern feminist revolution and that book, of course, is going to be a surprise to many women, uh, but we, 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 we write our books to please Allah. And if there are those who are happy with what we write, alhamdulillah, and if not, well then what can we do? We must not seek to please the people, 
and displease Allah, we should seek to please Allah, whether it is pleasing or not to the people. So that's book number four, the Jal and Woman. And the fifth and last book, which would be uh, on the Jal, the Quran, and Akhirul Zaman, the last age or the end of history, um, which would not, I hope, be difficult to write. When these five books are finished, then I pray to Allah. If he wants to send the angel, I'm ready to go. But I want time, please give me time to finish these five books, inshallah. Uh, remember, if you have any questions, you can call in at uh, 8.40, inshallah. Um, I will now be in Trinidad for the next two months. And during these two months, we will now resume our subject of money to try to conclude it. I still have to define money from the Quran and from the Sunnah. Um, so in the next probably two, two, two uh, sessions will be devoted uh, to money. Uh, but in addition to that, during these two months that I'll be in Trinidad, we will organize a private session, not public, private session for businessmen and for those who are interested to study the subject of money with me. A small group, maybe 25, 30 people, and we probably have some pilau to eat and uh, spend a few hours on the subject answering your questions. If you'd like to be a part of that group, uh, sometime you in the next two months to spend a few hours on the subject, uh, you can call IBN and leave your name and number, and then we will get back to you, inshallah. Uh, a special session devoted to money and in particular to electronic money that is coming. Uh, we are living in very, very disturbing times uh, during these last uh, few weeks, we have had hurricanes. In this part of the world, the Caribbean and North America, and they have taken a terrible toll, destroying homes, destroying villages, killing people, destroying infrastructure. Hurricanes at 160, 170, 180 kilometers an hour, or is it miles an hour? I don't know which one. And in addition to that, we have earthquakes. Massive earthquake in, um, in Mexico mm. and in other places. And I understand we just had one in Trinidad last night, maybe three on the Richter scale. And I had a dream of a, what you call it, the chus, chas, chasfun, where the earth is an, an earthquake in which the earth opens and swallows what it swallows. I just had that dream last night. Um, the Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, spoke about earthquakes and uh, these things in the end times. That there will be many earthquakes in the end times. But in particular, remember, he spoke about three massive earthquakes. Three of the ten major signs of the last day. Uh, the, he called them khusuf, which is the plural of Chas, an earthquake in which the earth opens and swallows what it swallows, like a sinkhole. And I thought that maybe the tsunami, tsunami of, was it 2004, where underneath the earth, underneath the ocean, there was this chas, uh, maybe an, uh, an atomic uh, bomb was exploded or whatever it was, and it created this massive tsunami. And I thought maybe that was the first chas of the East. And if that was true, then there's one to come in the West. I don't know where it will be. And then will come the third one, which will be in Arabia. Uh, that Imam al-Mahdi will proclaim himself to be the Mahdi in Mecca. And then an army will come from Sham to attack him. If an army is coming to attack the Imam al-Mahdi, it indicates that Sham or Syria will still be in a state of armed insurrection up to that time when the Mahdi comes. There will be no peace in Syria from now until that time because this army is coming from the north 
to attack the Imam. And uh, between Medina and Mecca, there will be this massive earthquake and this khas, the earth opens and swallows that army. And that will be the sign which confirms that this is the Imam al-Mahdi, not any eclipse in the sky or so. This is the major sign that this is the Imam al-Mahdi. So this is the time of earthquakes. This is the time of hurricanes. And we should therefore wake up and not be sleeping. I learned while I was in France a term that my grandmother's sister used to use because she was very old. She died in 1975 at the age of 104. And because of in her childhood, the, the French expressions were still used in Trinidad. She always used these French expressions. So for going to sleep, she used to say, Dodo, fed Dodo, go to sleep. For the children, fed Dodo, go to sleep. And this term Dodo is still used uh, in Trinidad. I heard it just yesterday. Dodo for sleeping. And that's, what's, that's what we have to say today about so many people in the world today, that they're still in the state of, of Dodo while we are living in the most dangerous times of all, the end time, the time of Dajjal, when there will be trials and tribulations and matters will cause tremendous distress. And also, in these end times, it will be very easy to lose your faith. Yes, so many attacks on religion, on the religious way of life, that you very easily can lose your faith. And you believe you're a Muslim or a Christian or a Jew and you die and you find out you're not. You've lost it. Hmm? Uh, the Prophet said, alayhi salatu waslam, and you can tell your friends of this as well, uh, reach out this hadith to them, this prophecy, that it will be so easy to lose your Islam, your faith, in the end times that a man will wake in the morning and lose his faith before the day has ended. He wakes up in the morning as a believer, as a mu'min, one who has faith. And by the time the night comes, he's lost it. In one day, you can lose your faith. And a man will go to sleep as a mu'min, having faith in his heart. And by the time he wakes up in the morning, his faith is lost. So in one night, you can lose your faith so easily that you can lose your faith in this time, the end times. And that's what we are lecturing on, the signs of the times. We know that we are living in the end times, don't we? Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, did he not say about the end times? You know it, don't you? that women will be dressed and yet naked? Of course, you see it every day and you walk on the streets, you go to the shopping malls and you see women dressed and yet naked. And when you see that, it should cause you to shiver with fear because you know this is a sign of the end time, the time when the religious way of life will be under attack. And people will lose their faith to such an extent that the Prophet also prophesied that 999 out of every 1,000 will enter into the hellfire in the end time. Only one for heaven. Only one for heaven. If that does not wake us up, what else can wake us, will wake us up? Is it that all of us will remain in the state of dodo? Huh? Just do do while all of these things are happening around us and we will not wake up. So the hurricanes which are taking place should wake us up. The earthquakes which are taking place should wake us up. Maybe another massive earthquake coming soon. Who knows? These are signs which should wake us up from our do do wake us up so we can pay attention 
to what guidance has come from Allah and from his messenger. How do we understand the world in which we live today? And how do we respond to it appropriately? In current events, very, very interesting things, disturbing things taking place around the world. Before we return to our subject of money, maybe you can allow me to comment briefly on these current events that are taking place. There is a country which used to be called Burma, Burma. Uh, but they now have changed the name to Myanmar, from Burma, Myanmar. And uh, the, the capital is Rangoon. I don't know whether they changed the name also from Rangoon. And uh, we, there is a community of mus Muslims living in Myanmar. Uh, they're called the Rohingya, I think. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And they are Muslims who originally belonged to Bengal and had migrated and settled in Myanmar, which is a Buddhist country. Uh, Buddhism is a religion of peace. Buddhism is a religion of non-violence. I studied Buddhism uh, as a student at the Alimia Institute of Islamic Studies, and indeed my first book that I wrote was on Islam and Buddhism in the modern world. I had a tremendous teacher. His name was Professor Yusuf Salim Chishti, who taught me the subject of Buddhism. And uh, after studying the religion of Buddhism, I developed great love in my heart for Gautama Buddha as a wonderful man and a tremendous, tremendous spiritual guide, Gautama Buddha. And uh, it was a religion of peace and of non-violence. And so it is something strange and mysterious that in Myanmar there should be so much violence directed against a helpless community of Muslims who have no weapons to defend themselves. They're small in number. And uh, you're using the weapons of mass uh, uh, killing, slaughter, violence, rape, all of these things. It's like Kashmir all over again. Why are the Buddhists behaving like this? How do we explain it? And it has been going on for a number of years now, this violence. Some of the Rohingya have left Burma or Myanmar and have gone to Bangladesh. And I remember when I visited Bangladesh for the last time, was it in 2003, about 14 years ago, and we traveled down to the south of Bangladesh, to uh, uh, Chittagong, and then to Cox's Bazaar, and then to Teknaf, which is the southernmost end of Bangladesh, Teknaf. And there in Teknaf, I saw the refugee camps of the Rohingya, who had come to Bangladesh from uh, uh, Myanmar, as refugees and were living in squalor. Um, but there's so many more in Myanmar and now there is this massive slaughter of the Myanmar Muslims by the Burmese military, it appears. And uh, so many have been writing to me asking me to comment on the subject. Uh, the it would be preferable that those who live in that region and who are scholars of Islam and who have more knowledge of the subject than I do, more intimate knowledge of the subject than I do, and the historical antecedents of the subject, that they should be the ones who should comment rather than me. But uh, my comment from far away Trinidad is that I smell, smell something bad. I smell that this is a part of a universal problem of war on Islam. To try to intimidate Muslims, to try to terrify Muslims, to try to break their morale, 
and uh, to try to make Islam look bad in the world. That there is problem between Islam and Hindu India. There is problem between Islam and Jewish Israel. There is problem between Islam and the Christian world. And now there is problem between Islam and the Jewish world. So Islam must be a terrible religion. That everybody in, in conflict with Islam. This seems to me to be part of the master plan. Uh, why, why the Buddhists are being provoked to attack the Rohingya Muslims again and again. Because it forms part of a master plan that is universal in character. And there is a mastermind at work to ensure that this takes place in the Buddhist world. Who is that mastermind? Of course we know. The mastermind is those who want the state of Israel to replace the United States of America as the next ruling state in the world. If you do not understand that subject, do please take a little time and read my book entitled Jerusalem in the Quran. Uh, it's available on my website, imranhussein.org. Uh, you can download it free of charge. You can also order it from my bookstore, imranhussein.com, which will explain to you the subject of uh, Israel wanting to rule the world. But I believe that there is also a pay master at work. And it will be good if someone or some group in that part of the world will conduct the necessary investigations to seek to provide, to, to obtain the evidence that the people are being paid. Yes, they're being paid to go and attack the Muslim Rohingya. If this is being done, we must know who is the paymaster and expose him before the world because no lie can survive forever. 9-11 didn't survive for too long. The whole world knows now it's a lie. So no lie can survive forever. Eventually a lie will be exposed. So if there are those who are paying Buddhists to go and attack Muslims in Myanmar, this will one day be exposed and we need to have it investigated to find out what is the truth over there. How then should we respond in Burma or Myanmar to this intense oppression? Well, it's the same thing. How should we respond, respond in Kashmir, where an Indian government is betraying the Hindu religion? We have respect for the Hindu religion. We can recognize in Hinduism traces of truth from the earliest time of all. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he ordered the angels to bow down and prostrate before Adam alayhi salam. Fasajadu. And they prostrated before Adam alayhi salam. Because prostration at that time in history was an act of respect and reverence. Prostration now is prohibited, but at that time it was permissible. And up to this day, the Hindus have preserved it. That a Hindu wife, there are others, of course, who are going to be feeling bad in their stock, but we don't care two peanuts for how they feel about it. The Hindu woman up to this day bows down and touches her husband's foot in respect and reverence. You can like it or you don't like it. We don't care two peanuts for your, your views. But this is Hinduism preserving a part of the truth which existed at the earliest time in history. The Hindu, the Indian government is betraying the Hindu religion at time and again. And it's time for Hindu scholarship to stand up and denounce the Indian government for what it's doing. The oppression of Kashmir is something that betrays the Hindu religion, really. And there's more that I'd like to say on the subject of Kashmir, but we leave that for another time. What do you do when you face intense oppression and you do not have the power to be able to protect yourself? Let me repeat that question. What do you do when you are a believer and you're facing intense oppression because you're a believer, for example? 
And you do not have the power to be able to resist the oppressor. Your houses are being destroyed. You're being injured, you're being killed, your women are being raped. Your children are suffering. What do you do? Answer, Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, and the Muslims face precisely that situation in Makkah, which our people are facing today in the Holy Land, in Gaza, in Israel. What do you do? What did they do in Makkah? Makkah is the holy of, of cities. It's the center of the world for the Arab. Makkah. And yet they made hijrah. Yes, they made hijrah. They left sacred, blessed Makkah. Ummul Qura, the mother of all cities. They left Makkah to go to a place where there was more security. And so they went to Medina. And so my advice to the Muslims of Myanmar, my advice to the Muslims of Kashmir, those who are willing to listen to my advice, not everybody willing to listen, not even here in Trinidad. So my advice is if you are facing oppression and you lack the capacity to resist the oppressor and oppression becomes so intense that you cannot bear it anymore, then the, the, the guidance from the Quran and from the Sunnah a prophet, Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, is to leave wherever you are and seek sanctuary and safety in some other place. Allah's earth is wide, and if you make the effort to make hijrah, Allah can open doors for you where even there are no doors. I don't think all the Muslims of Kashmir will take that advice, no. But those who wish to follow my advice that I extend to you lovingly as a brother who loves you is to leave Kashmir and find sanctuary somewhere else where you will not be so oppressed. Leave Myanmar if you can and find sanctuary somewhere else. However, how do you leave a country when you have nowhere to go? This is a subject we'll take up inshallah in another session when we deal on political philosophy. We have a situation now in Kashmir in which Pakistan is, has become the target. And uh, the rhetoric between India and Pakistan is intensifying to such an extent that there is a greater fear of war today than for many, many moons in the past. Hmm? And it is necessary for us to direct attention once again to Pakistan, as we have done many times in the past, and to India's role, India's role in this encirclement of Pakistan in order to try to finish off this country of Pakistan. That seems to be the master plan, to make Pakistan a subservient state to those who want to control power in the world. Mm. How do we respond to that? I cannot, in this little time that we now have left, just 10 minutes, uh, devote uh, time to this subject now. But it is clearly a very dangerous situation in India and Pakistan. And the scholars of Hinduism and the scholars of Islam ought to be coming together to put your heads together, to try to see how we can resolve, how we can guide our people in these dangerous times. I have respect for the Hindu religion. I have many Hindu friends who are listening to this lecture as I speak. 